This is EHA today at the Cardiology Update in Davos, Switzerland 2017. I'm Tom Luscher, Editor-in-Chief uh, of the European Heart Journal, and I'm talking uh, to uh, Mark Pfeffer, a friend, Associate Editor of the European Heart Journal now, and uh, Victor Zhao, Professor at Harvard Medical School in Boston. Welcome, Mark. So we're going to talk about hypertension and how it evolved uh, over the last uh, four decades. A very impressive uh, body of evidence and uh, you gave a very nice lecture on it. Uh, so uh, what did we learn? Well, actually, Thomas, I enjoyed coming and I enjoyed giving this lecture because uh, you know, we're arguing over millimeters of mercury and I thought it was time to step back and talk about the very rich heritage we have mm -hmm. and why we treat hypertension. Because if physicians aren't motivated and don't have uh, the respect of the patient, then when you give an asymptomatic patient a medication that doesn't make them feel better uh, and they don't take it, it doesn't make anybody any better. So we have a huge challenge because the success of what we're doing, people are living longer. And as they live longer, the prevalence of hypertension is getting uh, in the population higher and higher. So it's not a trivial problem at all. As a matter of fact, any epidemiologist would tell you it's the number one modifiable risk factor. Uh, you know, smoking, of course, but number one reason to give people a medication. And you have to convince them that because they feel good. And, and it, there's no pill that makes you feel better. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So It may be worse in some instances, yeah. And, you know, what I tell patients is we have 120 different choices. Yes. If what I'm doing for you makes you feel worse, please call me and we'll change. And we will find one that you don't even know you're taking, except your blood pressure will be controlled. And let me re change that. It might be two or three. Yeah. We will find the choice of regimen for you. Individualized medicine. Individualized, sure. Yeah. But the heritage, that's what's so impressive. Mm -hmm. So when did it start? Well, it started with insurance companies mm -hmm. <laughs> saying, uh, I'm going to charge this person more money for life insurance if their blood pressure is elevated. They so immediately they knew, knew that uh, knew this is because, bad news. Because they were betting on it. But for medicine, it really starts with Framingham saying, wow, here's one of the factors associated with higher risk. And then we have to go to the VA cooperative studies, starting in the 1960s, finishing in 1967, the first one, and then 70, showing that throwing three antihypertensive drugs in a randomized placebo-controlled trial versus placebo lowered people's risk, risk of dying, risk of uh, heart failure, risk of uh, aneurysm dissection. So really major league. And that was a breakthrough because I, in my lecture, I showed a, a, um, a sentence that uh, a word of Paul W. White, who yes. uh, said actually, you shouldn't touch hypertension, it only creates troubles. And, uh, and they underestimated the, the, the importance of it. Well, I enjoyed hearing that in your lecture, and that reminded me the word was called essential hypertension because the experts at the time, and you know, we're all wrong 20 years from now, we'll be wrong in what we're saying today, but we're saying essential to perfuse your brain. Well, obviously, we know it's still also... In German, they called it Erfordernis Blutdruck because it was necessary. necessary. Yeah, exactly. So this changed really medicine. Well, it didn't immediately. So the results came out and people weren't doing it. Now, it's easy for me to look back, but if you look at the tools they had, the medications were very difficult to take. And the level of evidence was not enough to convince the world. As a matter of fact, on the European side, they said that this isn't enough. Uh, even in the U.S., the uh, hypertension detection follow-up trial was still placebo-controlled. And if they referred to physicians, either step care or referred. And, it, and I like to look back and say, referred care, send the person to their doctor, and 40% with elevated blood pressure didn't get any treatment because that was what the times were. So that showed a mortality benefit than uh, uh, the British study. Uh, um, there were uh, uh, quite a few, but they were all using diastolic. Yeah, that's right. When I was a fellow, they, we, we only looked at diastolic for some reason. As a matter of fact, even to get approval at the FDA, it was diastolic pressure. 
But then it became apparent that uh, as you age, diastolic pressure comes down, systolic goes up for all the work you've been doing on blood vessels and reactivity. And then um, studies started to target systolic pressure and show it even if your diastolic pressure is below 90, but you had an elevated systolic pressure, and you were on placebo, you didn't do well. Now newer drugs are coming along. So now I'm taking you to the 1980s. That was Sheps and Sister, huh? Yes, so one in Europe and, and one in the America. It's interesting to me to see how each region needed its own at that time, but uh, clearly showed treating systolic hypertension lowered risk. And we're talking about risk of death. So very important. Mm -hmm. So now, the word's getting out. Uh, there's a reason to treat. Then we get into the competition, my drug, your drug. Mm -hmm. I would say that was the whole 1990s mm -hmm. uh, um, into the 2000s. Uh, no real winners. Yes, someone can raise their hand and say, I'd rather be on this kind of, but the real message is control of blood pressure right. using multiple drugs. But now the newest round is and where should I take you to? And uh, that I think there's more hype, more smoke than reality, because uh, uh, the importance is finding people with elevated blood pressure, controlling it. And how you control and how much, uh, that's what the debates are about now. But there was another issue, and that was age. At some point, yes. they said, you know, if you're 80, yeah. It doesn't well, matter. You heard what I said at the lecture. I said, uh, when you treat a human being, you shouldn't be asking for their passport or their birth certificate. You should be looking at them and, you know, suddenly if you become 80 and your 79 is different than 80, and we all know people age differently, and, and please don't uh, 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 discriminate against someone because they happen to be strong enough and lucky enough to live to 80. And that's what the data actually showed. So uh, I think I was getting into now uh, uh, that target. And here, what I'd like to say uh, for your audience is that blood pressure is not a disease. Everybody has a blood pressure. And it's a continuum. It's a continuum. So at what point is it better to continue to push or to leave the person alone? So it's clear in some people pushing lower uh, helps them. It's also clear in some people pushing lower produces drug-related effects. Yeah, like renal failure. Uh, not so much renal failure. It would be renal failure if you continued. Yeah, yeah. But that's where being a doctor, yeah, yeah. back off, back off, have to back off. treat the person. Right. So Bert Pitt likes to talk about uh, 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 spironolactone, that you don't just give it, it's like, a, uh, it's like an anticoagulant. I think it's the same for blood pressure. Right. Yes, we write somebody a prescription, but if you follow that person, if they can't stand when they, and they're at risk of tripping going to the bathroom at night because they're orthostatic, you've overshot. If they have renal problems, you've overshot. But that doesn't mean population-wise it's not a good thing to do in those who tolerate it. So I don't get into the debate as much 120, 140, 130. I get into the debate, please treat, and then individualize. Well, that's a very good statement uh, for uh, those who are seeing patients with hypertension. Thank you very much for sharing that with us, Mark. My pleasure.